So welcome to the sixth episode of uh, the Corona Dialogue, uh, Love, Life and Work in the Human World. And um, today we have a special guest, uh, Jay Goldstein from San Diego in the US uh, to share his ideas and his, uh, ins how should I say, uh, insights about something which is, um, it seems that there is not a lot of space these days in, in the so-called VUCA world. And that is actually, we're talking about our emotions. Um, the title of today's talk, dialogue is um, Boys Don't Cry, Men Do. And um, of course, you know, it tries to be provocative, but uh, one step at a time. So welcome, Jay. Thanks, Thomas. I been enjoying your recordings and uh, the dialogues. And I'm really, uh, I'm honored to, to, uh, to join in today, you know, and I think you've got a, um, I think you've been showing a gift for bringing out your humanity uh, in yourself and others. So, so it's great to be here. Great. Looks like we well, got maybe someone yeah. joining too. Yes. Hi, Brian. Schönen um, guten Morgen. Hi. Uh, Brian, I will uh, mute you for the first couple of minutes. Um, oops. Um, okay. Um, Jay, maybe can say, tell us uh, in a few sentences what you were doing in San Diego uh, so that um, Christian and, and Brian they know a little bit more about you. Yeah, well, for the uh, past two years, uh, Christian, what, our little pre-talk here today, uh, you'll, you'll appreciate. Um, I've been um, working uh, in one of the world's largest uh, consulting companies. And uh, as a... Um, a business agility transformation lead or an enterprise transformation coach. And um, the, uh, uh, th that's, that's a whole story in itself, you know, of, of the adoption, uh, not only within the clients, uh, but internally within the organization um, as they're uh, struggling to adopt their own new ways of working. Uh, so I've been involved in both the client transformation, but also my own company's transformation <laughs> now i know why you're an expert in crying men <laughs> <laughs> yeah and, and and dealing with uh, late adopters you know uh in some cases the uh you know power companies and uh, u.s large retailers and uh, uh you know interesting folks along the the awareness uh, spectrum we might say well you know, I remember the first, uh, it was like two years ago, almost two years ago when we, uh, Jay and I, we met uh, in Chicago, we talked about, you know, the very topic of, you know, boys and crime men, men, uh, men do. And, you know, that's definitely, you know, I still remember this dialogue very freshly, but tell us, I mean, um, you, you actually said like, you have to like, uh, like to share your insights for 10 minutes and then have some a number of questions. Uh, and then of course we open the dialogue for everyone to, uh, to dive in. So, yeah. Yeah, thanks. I'm, um, I think um, for me, I like to uh, have a, a framework or an approach. I, you know, I was a philosophy major when I was in undergraduate school. And, and, and so, uh, so it's helpful for me to kind of look at, at things broadly and then talk about them specifically. And, um, and also, I think this crisis has led me to want to, to wanna kind of return to first principles, you know. Um, how do I really want to be in the world going forward, you know, uh, and, and, I, and I do think there's, I, I like your topic, I do think there's some insights we could kind of bring out of it, you know, in this irony of boys don't cry, men, men do. And um, it was kind of funny, after you set the topic up last Sunday, uh, I happened to break quarantine a little bit uh, and saw my 20 month old grandson. And for the first time, you know, in a while, so really, really missing him. We're having so, socially distanced uh, meal with his parents, but of course, little Jack's going to be running, you know, everywhere he wants to, which is delightful. But wouldn't you know it? He's playing in the yard with with a, a, a large rock, and he kind of drops it on his finger, right? And and he starts to cry, and uh, you know, he looks up at me, and and his lip starts to quiver, and uh, you know, the tears begin to well, and he's holding out his little uh, hurt finger. And it's like right there as a grandparent, you know, as a grand, his grandfather, I have an opportunity to teach him. You know, how, how is he going to deal with this, his hurt and pain? So, you know, so I'm, I'm right here kind of in the midst thinking about this, even after we set up our topic. And it, it reminds me that um, 
I th someone said once that you know when we start out as children, we have uh, and we start out in life, we have a 360 degree personality, and uh, whatever we desire to express, you know, whomever we want to be in the moment, uh, we are right. You know, one minute my grandson's dancing enjoy to some music, you know, the next he's crying over the rock, a little while later he's happily kicking a ball and um, he ended up, it was pretty warm out in San Diego. He was, we turned on the, the spigot in the yard and, and, you know, then he's naked and playing in the water, you know, all, all the personality being expressed uh, all the way around. And, and on this topic, I recall um, a friend of mine, Peter, sharing his own uh, boys don't cry story. Uh, when he was about seven years old, you know, he, typical thing, he comes home from being hurt at the playground by some older boys, comes in, his parents are there, and, you know, his father's response is, you know, you know buck up, you know, don't cry, be strong. And you know, we all have these experiences that we, um, we find out that certain parts of our 360 degree personality are acceptable, right? And, and some of them are not. And um, the ones that aren't, you know, we put into what Jung calls the shadow, I believe. Uh, the parts of us, you know, we deny, repress, and ignore. And, and it's not just that some boys' um, personalities contract because they're taught not to cry. It could be anything. For me, it, it was um, when I was four or five years old, uh, my older brother was being uh, abused by a babysitter. And the, the sitter made my older brother and sister and I form a sort of um, pa secret, you know, pact of secrecy not to tell our parents. And I'm confused, I'm scared, I'm, I feel alone. Um, and at this point now I'm cut off from the very people I wanna you know, share this with, my parents. And so you know, the, 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 some of these, these parts of ourselves that aren't loved or expressed, um, you know, we're making, we're making decisions um, about, about our personality, just unconsciously. And I, and I think the sum of these decisions sort of becomes our personal operating system, so to speak. Um, you know, boys learn if they cried, some of them, you know, they're going to be, they're going to be knocked, you know, I'll give you something to cry about, don't do that, right? And so it's a rational decision for a while, don't cry, right? And, and, and so we all kind of make strategies like this. So Peter, you know, Peter decided in his own way, he, he, um, he wasn't going to show his tears again, and he was just going to be really good. And, you know, by, by um, 17, he was an Eagle Scout. And, and then later, uh, when I, by the time I met him, he was a PhD and, in a, and a global um, prize winning chemist. I decided um, after my experiences with the uh, babysitter, that I was just going to have to figure things out on my own. You know, I, if I, I was always a curious child, but this experience at four and five, it kind of kicked that curiosity into overdrive. And I felt like if I could only learn enough, you know, about something, I could, I believe somehow I could protect myself. You know, I could control the world better. I could keep myself safe. And, um, and I remember I like, uh, 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 memorize the order of the planets, you know, Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, in those days, Neptune and Pluto, <laughs> before I went to kindergarten. And, um, and, and then I remember being anxious the night before I started grade school, uh, first grade. Uh, somehow it got into my mind that um, uh, you were supposed to know arithmetic by the time you went to first grade. And so I snuck out of bed, I snuck into my brother's room, he was in middle school by this point. And under the covers with a flashlight and a pe you know, pencil and, and paper, he taught me the basics of arithmetic and you know, multiple addition. And, and, and I was able to go back to bed and, and be, feel at peace and ready for first grade. And it's just sort of the strategies I came up with, you know. And, you know, for a while, these strategies work for us. Um, but then they become self-limiting. And, uh, and the parts that we've suppressed are... I, I, I describe as sort of like a wild teenage boy, you know, they rebel and they want to come out sideways in order to be acknowledged. And, 
And so strategies work until they just don't work anymore. And we need an upgrade. We need an OS up, personal OS upgrade, some sort of additional tool, some more awareness. My strategy ran out during my struggles in my first marriage. Um, I mean, it was limiting before that, but I think this is really where it came to a head for me. I had tried everything I could think of to make it work, my relationship. You know, I was creative and experimental like I'd always been uh, since a child. And, and sometimes I'd try things even that were opposites of each other, you know, with my wife. I would, I would hear, you know, you should really pay attention and do active listening and, you know, attend. And, and, and I would do that for a while, but it wouldn't seem to make things better. So I said, well, maybe, you know, um, maybe she really just needs some space. You know, I'll give her, I'll give her some time and, and distance, but none of that worked. And then, um, and I was just, I'd, I'd kind of just finally run out of, of things, which takes a while for me. Um, and, um, but I've, I've found I'd taken on this, um, this sort of hypervigilant inner parent um, that was trying to keep this little five-year-old safe but it also was keeping him sort of frozen in time. Um, and, um, and I wasn't able to really come out and play and, you know, and be trusting and present uh, for my wife and others. And Peter knew there was something missing also. And, and we showed up on this weekend, this men's intensive retreat weekend. And he's, he experienced um, re, kind of going back to the, some of that stuff uh, and dealing with it that had happened like on the playground and, and, and said he cried for the first time in, in over 30 years, you know, since then. Um, and so, you know, I think the, the, the journey from boy to uh, authentic manhood, I would say indeed the journey from living for anybody, you know, in a kind of contract, contracted and fear-based place to being um, fully conscious, open and authentic adult, uh, and a, certainly a journey I've been on. Um, but I've also had the privilege to witness it uh, and, and become a guide and a, and a facilitator. Uh, after that initial weekend, I was, I was excited enough about that approach, those approaches that um, you know, I got some training and I continue to go on those uh, and be, be a facilitator and guide for now about 25 of those uh, types of intensive uh, weekend experiences. But, uh, but I, I think this, this, um, I think this experience is really, these types of experiences where we upgrade our personal OS, uh, I think they're universal, you know, they're part of our universal human journey. Um, you know, some of you, you've probably read Joseph Campbell or seen his stuff. He says the hero's journey is so common, you know, throughout all of human cultures and, and history. Um, he calls it the hero with a thousand faces. Uh, we can see, I see the themes in ancient spiritual traditions the perennial philosophies in mod our modern leadership training, um, the tools, some of the tools we use for self-awareness uh, that I've, I'm familiar with, like Myers-Briggs and Strength Finders and uh, the DISC and Enneagram. And now I see confirmation you know, for this stuff in, um, in brain scan, right? We can actually see where the parts of the brain are lighting up, uh, the neural research, uh, the impact of memories uh, on, um, and you know, and the disadvantages of activating our fear center, and the advantages of being in our peace and flow, and in our prefrontal cortex. Um, I think the truths are reflected in Jung, like I mentioned. I think Viktor Frankl, uh, and um, you know, we experience the benefits also. Those of us that do the work here in organizations, right, that adopt more trusting and and collaborative uh, ways of working, ways that unlock human potential and collective intelligence. So I think for me, uh, Tom, so the journey during the, the COVID crisis um, activated that hypervigilant part of me, you know, that wanted to, to, to learn everything. Uh, you know, I was trying to read everything about the disease. I was, I was trying to follow all the news, um, but I also experienced the invitation in this time from folks like yourself and and, and, and within me at times um, to notice what's going on, be grateful, you know, even for that part of me that sort of was driven that, that lifelong learning. Um, you know, know, it served me in some ways well, but I just kind of have to ask it to quiet down, <laughs> you know, and, and let, 
let me trust and be open and, and uh, be open for what opportunities are, are emerging out of this, this crisis. And anyway, so, you know, with my grandson on Sunday, um, I think one of the great things about being a grandparent is I'm not as attached to how Jack functions. You know, I mean, if he's, if he's, um, has a tantrum, it's like, it's delightful for me <laughs> yeah, as, as if he's kicking a ball around happily or he's crying over, you know, hurting his finger or he's sitting in my lap reading. And so I, um, uh, at that moment, you know, I, I when he, he was, he was reaching out and, and his tears, I, I just mirrored back to him um, his pain, you know, uh, until it passed, which, you know, at that age is about 30 seconds. <laughs> and, uh, I just, I just want to be present with him, right. And, in in everything in his life and, uh, in his journey. And anyway, it got me thinking about, um, it got me thinking about this ancient, it got me thinking about an old poem, um, I had heard about, but it's also, it's a 700 year old poem you might be familiar with, uh, this idea of welcoming these parts of ourselves, it's not a new concept. And so I just thought I'd end my, mm -hmm. my, my little discussion here with reading from this, or, or kick off the discussion part here. Um, I might even, Bill, can I share it on the screen? Yeah, uh, well, you should be able to, let me double check. I uh, think I leave. can, tell me if it comes up. Um, yes, it does. Yep. So this is by Rumi, it's called The Guest House, The Irony, of course, for a lot of us who are in isolation now is we can't even, you know, have guests over. So, but this is a kind of guest, guest we can welcome. He says, this being human is a guest house. Every morning, a new arrival, a joy, a depression, a meanness, some momentary awareness comes as an unexpected visitor. Welcome and entertain them all. Even if they are a crowd of sorrows, who violently sweep your house empty of its furniture. Still, treat each guest honorably. He may be clearing you out for some new delight. The dark thought, the shame, the malice. Meet them at the door laughing and invite them in. Be grateful for whoever comes because each has been sent as a guide from beyond. So kind of, kind of good words for me in, in a times of crisis. Yeah, very, very powerful. Thank you for sharing. Um, I'd, like to, I'd like to come back to you because you said you talked about the men's uh, weekend and when uh, uh, Peter was the first time in 30 years that he cried again, uh, what happened? That was it like a breakthrough or was it like letting go of some old control patterns which mm -hmm. didn't serve him anymore? Or what was it that... I think, shift. I, I think one of the, um, one of the kind of false uh, assumptions our psyches live under is that we can selectively uh, deny certain feelings, you know, and uh, like I'm uncomfortable with fear or I'm on, uh, you know, or I'm comfortable with sadness. I'm uncomfortable with sadness. I'm not going to cry. And, um, but what, what happens is uh, in order to suppress one feeling and, and feelings, I, th I think are really can be understood best just as kind of, of a, a somatic experience of a sensation, a way of uh, our body uh, processes or thinks. Um, we suppress one, we suppress them all. And, and so, you know, Peter may have wanted uh, joy in his life. And I think that's kind of was one of his stated things. But what happens, um, one of the ways to kind of get at this is to say, well, what's blocking uh, you from experiencing that, right? Mm -hmm. If you want it, if you know, if you, if you want it and you don't have it, what's the gap? And the gap ends up <clears throat> being um, these these patterns, these mental tapes, and these decisions that that have accumulated, and we've 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 put on, and so there are various uh, ways to um, to reframe, you know, become aware and reframe 
those those experiences and once once the freedom to experience the part that we've been denying suppressing ignoring is there um, then other things come along with it that we've unintentionally also put you know out of consciousness so so what what is it that's blocking us from experiencing you say our emotions or you know, i guess why is it so difficult that, why is it so difficult for us to acknowledge and accept our emotions well i think i, I i'd say it's yeah, that's not true for everybody, but um, <clears throat> it's. But it, I think it has to do again with the sort of uh, uh, um, being what's appropriate, you know, well, what's acceptable, and mm -hmm. um, and this the, this that we could kind of selectively pick our personality, right? So for for each person, it's their own it's their own journey. Um, you know, I might turn the question back to you or someone on the call today. You know, you're, Thomas, what do you, what have you been aspiring to or wanting to experience during the, this crisis, for example, that, that, um, you know, you, you would, you would like, you know, just pick something. What's it been for you? For, for me, it was like, it's a roller coaster. It has been a roller coaster because, um, you know, not having any revenue as, you know, running your own business, is not that, right. that much fun. So uh, the good thing is, uh, unlike, let's say, two or three years ago, I can speak about it more openly, um, even though sometimes I still have a hard time because I don't show my vulnerable side. Not so much as that it would not be acceptable because I know by now it is acceptable, but um, maybe, maybe because I like to portray an image uh, of like a, a, the tough guy and you know, everything is under control and et cetera, which of course in this case it's not. And my experience has been like when I acknowledge it and, and talk about it more openly uh, and, and share it um, quite often the other side, the, on the, other, the other person or the other people, you know, they, um, they say, well, we have experienced something similar. And this again makes me feel less bad than, than before. It was two yeah. weeks ago that Donna shared her, her story of 2008 during the last financial crisis, yeah. um, you know, which we call common humanity. And sharing my emotions uh, just is also a reminder for myself that I'm human after all. Right. And so for you, what, what comes up for you, I hear, is that you you want to um, you want to be you want people to experience you as being competent. Um, so if you were if you were to have revenue, for example, you mentioned you don't have revenue. What what would you get? What would you feel? You'd feel um, like you'd feel uh, competent, and you'd feel. Well, that's that's an ex excellent question because um, the ego would say, "Thank God, you know, there is revenue, there is financial stability." Right. Um, the heart will say, well, okay, great, but what will you be doing? Is what you will, what I will be doing, is it in sync with what my heart desires? And um, so, because ideally there is a, it's a balance. Um, yeah. So it's like on the, I guess it's the Maslow pyramid. You would say, you know, financial, there is financial stability or physical security and then things are okay, but you know, then uh, the next moment you start thinking, it's like, is this all? It's more to yeah. more to it. So no, sure. I, I um, over the last two, especially last two weeks or so, you know, where uh, in the morning I had some some a dialogue with with my wife. We talked about say where else can we save money. Uh, I I felt pretty bad. Um, you know, you you experience fear and you talk about it openly. And then I ride my bicycle to my to my office, and I just look look around. It's like you know the beautiful nature. I, I'm healthy. You know, there's the sun is shining. It, it's it's a perfect morning. And I'm just very grateful for this very moment. And I thought, this mm -hmm. is great. This makes me feel so much better. Uh, okay, the, the financial security is still not there, but you know, I still feel better. Right. But you figure. <laughs> so you're, you, you imagine a life where you feel grateful, you're an appreciative of, of your surroundings and your life and the beauty, right? That's, I hear what, part of what you're saying. Exactly. Right? Because, uh, this, and, you, this... and, you, and you want to live into that. You want to sort of live into that. and kind of in a perpetual way, right? To be in that state of 
of, of enjoying the, the peace, the beauty, and being grateful for that. That's, that's what I hear you say. And so I would ask, what, when you go for that, you know, in your life, for that, for that, that state, what comes up for you that blocks it? The, to, you mean to be to feeling more alive or yeah to being oh, in that state of gratitude and oh, appreciating is, beauty now the story you tell yourself is that it's about doing uh work that produces revenue that that meets the desires of your heart but you know if we go back to like franco for example my kind of one of my heroes you know he's he's in the camp at auschwitz and and he's in charge of his he notices he can be in charge of his inner state, right? Yes, yes. That they could do whatever they want externally to him. But, and he found about 5% of folks coming into the camps had this sort of innate ability. And he sort of dedicated the rest of his life to helping others um, have that freedom, freedom to choose, right? And, and so what's blocks for you, you, know, you imagine going for that, what blocks your freedom to be in that state, regardless of your external, con the content of your it's life? The, in this case, it's the mind, it's the head, or it's the, you can, some people say, maybe the ego. Um, yeah, but for you, like, what, com what comes up? Imagine a situation where you're going for that. Like, you went, you're on the bike ride, and you're, you're going to your office, and then you're out of that state. Like, what took you out of it, you know? Or what took you out of it before you went on your bike ride? You said you were having the conversation with your wife. Yes. And fear came up. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so the fear comes up. And that's, that's what we would work with. We'd say, well, where, where is that, you know, and, and for that, you? And that, and that actually has turned, you know, and, and it, it may be real that there may be a lack of funds, what have you, lack of revenue, what, so what have you. However, the fear itself is like, uh, a figment of my imagination. It's, I guess it's a uh, uh, kind of like fake news. <laughs> and when I, when you listen uh, to it's fake not news, fake. it's real. It's real. It's, it's um, real. It's, it's absolutely real, and that's why we want to bring it into awareness and to welcome it, as the guest house would suggest. Yes. Yeah. And and so uh, because because yeah, it's coming out anyway. Right? Yeah. <laughs> it's it's coming out anyway. It's and blocking, you know, your access. So, but I think we're talking about, um, and Thomas, when I'm listening to you, I'm listening to myself. Um, I have the same issues as you. And, and me too, by the way. I'm, I, I could go through the same story. So thank so, you for saying that. Um, I'm much more in, in that uh, thought, on that thought train of does the world actually need me? And I'm not saying no, and I'm, you know, I'm pretty confident in that I'm providing somehow like value to, to the world, to the surroundings, to my children and, and everybody around me. And the, the things that we associate that worth for others with money in many ways. And now we, in this country, we have the debate of what is systems relevant and what's not. Clearly, if I were a nurse, if I were a doctor, I would not be talking about the same thing I'm talking about now. And so I'm asking myself, am I actually valuable to humanity? Or have I been like a blood sucking consultant uh, who has, you know, built his financial wealth on the back of others, which hasn't actually served humanity? Is it actually, is it, about, is it redundant what I'm doing to humanity? And that's the thought that preoccupies my mind at this mm. point in time. And it goes along with obviously now, you know, extremely restricted financial yeah. means. So you want to live in a, in a world where you feel valued and, and worthwhile, right? Well, it's, it's and, not that I don't, it's not that I don't, but I'm, I'm just questioning with, you know, with the situation sure. that's now there, whether what I'm doing is, is a service to humanity. I'm, I'm sort of, yeah, I don't know whether that makes sense, but yeah. it's like, because I'm not being paid right now, is that if I were a doctor, I would be, I wouldn't have a problem. But because I'm only a you know smart cookie, and it's, yeah, I'm hearing what you were saying, Jay, very much in my own biography, and by virtue of thinking, you're going to be able to understand the universe, and you're going to be able to steer the world, whatever. It's just just a whole pile of nonsense. And is my whole life built on a pile of imagination, of you know, uh, like a 
you know, too much a picture of too high self worth, and that's being rewarded by money from the outside for something that nobody actually really needs. And, so, and what would be um, what would be what would be your experience? What would be true for you if the world was if that were true in the world? How would you feel? Uh, I think I would feel pretty awful. Like if I felt that I'd wasted the first 47 years for the sake of yeah. something that only benefited my, me and my head, my, my personal fake news story. Mm -hmm. And, and if, and, and so you're, you're in that world and you're, you're feeling that. And then, and then there, I would, I would suggest there's probably another part of yourself that would, that would um, question whether that is even true, right? Like, uh, yes, there is. So, you know, w the part of you that would say, w in fact, if you were as a consultant and a coach, that you would tell others most likely, right? Of course. Who were, oh. who were sharing this about their fundamental value and worth as a human being, regardless of what they do, right? No and, doubt about it. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. And, and it's fun, yeah. ironic, right, for us, it's often on oh, here. Yeah. In fact, when my men gather, we gather on Thursday nights and we're doing it on Zoom like this now. Um, many times, I much prefer actually um, being the facilitator to other men, you know, than, than being the one that's the recipient of it, right? It's of like, you, I'd rather you do my work than me. <laughs> of so, course. Uh, it's so, cool. but yeah. Oh. But then, you know, going to the mirror of what we know, so, so you, have, you have this part of you that, that, that knows the fundamental value and worth that, that you and everybody has, and yet you, you, know, you feel it uh, challenged in you, to, to achieve that state of peace around that truth, right, um, given, mm -hmm. um, given the questions you have about, um, you know, what, uh, what the world values right now. And so, yeah. so to me, the, the interesting question still comes up of saying, well, if that's actually the truth that I want to live into, that have fundamental value and worth uh, as a birthright, you know, uh, to be to be to be loved, cherished, and valued, and 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 yet, you know, I I am occupied with these other f fears or doubts. Um, how can I move on to move? You know, what's how can I move to the journey of having more of this, right? Yeah, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, there's no two ways about that. I'm on that path, but it requires yeah. a lot of unlearning and a lot of re <laughs> rebuilding of, of um, just uh, certainties um, and of, you know, a completely different picture of self-worth. As yeah. in, I, you know, I'm in the process of abandoning a lot of things that I own. Like I'm, I will probably be forced to say, I have to sell my house. Uh, my children uh, will have to move house, find a new home. My wife, who's extremely security uh, aware and needy, uh, is in deep trouble, much deeper than myself. I'm, I'm in a relative place of peace, uh, but she's not. Um, and, uh, you know, there's just a lot of challenges that I, you know, everything is just, everything's just tumbling. And I'm welcoming all the guests to my house. And I, right. I'm very thankful for, you know, spiritual practice that I've been, you know, lucky to experience the last decade or so. Had I not had that, had, would I not have that, I think I'd be shattered. Um, yeah. And, yeah. you know, crying helped me uh, a fair bit, right. you know, getting back to the point of, and actually crying in public. I'm crying everywhere I go, but I'm very, you know, whenever music plays, I'll start crying. Mm -hmm. I feel yeah. touched and when beautiful, I, mean, I cry like 80% more beautiful than that. That's all good things that. Yeah, very tender now. Yeah, I, I hear that. Yeah, those are those are challenging circumstances, but it, it also sounds like there's been something preparing you uh, yeah. for for these challenges to uh, accept them as the, you know, there may be also opportunities that emerge. Um, Absolutely. In Big these time. experiences together. Um, I mean, I, you know, not, not, none of our, our, you know, getting back to the, 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 the Franco thing, it's like none of his inner choices took away the outer reality, right? They just, they just gave him the, 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 the freedom of how he was going to be with that content, how he was, what some people, a friend of mine, Jim Deathmer calls, 
the difference between the content of our lives and the context for which we're with it. And, you know, we don't, we don't have control the content uh, much, but we have choice over how we are with it. Uh, and, um, and I, I think that's just fundamental to our, to our human journey, you know, and, and, I, and I think the transformation we also bring to, to businesses, you know, to, to move uh, people into that those kinds of awareness. Yeah, and I'm you know, getting back to your original picture of the 360 degree personality, you know, human rearm. Um, that's a picture that I really love and I thank you for inspiring me that way because mm -hmm. I feel that all of us have really diminished from that 360 degree spectrum into something, you know, largely socially desired. And I'm trying to claw my way back into wholeness, into mm -hmm. Uh, you know, the fundamental security of knowing that whatever I do is okay. Mm -hmm. um, and that's a long way because society has, especially our Western society, has made sure that we comply yeah. um, and not that we live. Um, yeah. And, uh, you know, I'm just on my way. Yeah, I, um, it, I resisted... Uh... In 2008, I had just uh, gone through my divorce, and then I had just uh, acquired uh, a business. My, I, as an entrepreneur, I, I had acquired and, and, and grown and sold some businesses, and one of them I had to sell during my, um, my divorce. It was really taken off, and so I leveraged the, the little bit I had left. I remember sitting with a friend in a coffee shop, and, and I had a little credit on my Starbucks card, and I, I held it up, and I said, I said, see that credit? That's my net worth right now. <laughs> So I put everything into this business right before the financial crash. And it was, and, and our products were sold through retail. So, uh, and about a year, a year and a half later, um, I went to a, a, one of the hardware show conferences and all of the people who own these little hardware stores around the country, you know, it was a network of like 3,500 of these, were already reporting uh, that their business was off 30%. You know, this is, this is like main street business and nothing had been said in the news yet of the crash. This is, this is February or March of the year when Lehman brothers failed in September. And, um, and I was in trouble, you know, and ultimately, um, I, again, my hypervigilance. So I, I tried everything and you know, I, I, I thought I could acquire business, I thought I could sell it. I, I sold off some of the brands. I did this, I did that. And eventually I had to bankrupt the business. But since I was the sole, you know, I was the main proprietor, I was personal guaranteed on all those, on all those loans, right? So in order to continue, I also had to go through a personal bankruptcy and, and, and deal with, with threats of foreclosure in, at my home. And at the same time, I'm trying to keep a relationship with my children who are being, you know, being told by my ex that, um, that they shouldn't have anything to do with me. <laughs> So, um, yeah, uh, fortunately, I, like you're describing, um, uh, you know, I'd kind of stepped up this work uh, in my initial weekend was 98. And now this was about 2008, actually, at that point, 2007. So, mm. you know, I'd, I'd, um, I'd had a, a little bit of, uh, of time um, to prepare uh, and um, do the the counterintuitive things, for example, with my children who were, um, you know, turned pretty hard. I, I came home one night and uh, my 11 year old son at the time, he's my middle boy, uh, was acting as a spokesman for his brother and sister and mother. And he said, uh, he said, dad, um, I've got a question for you. He says, why do you, why are you still living in the house? So we were kind of had an in-house separation and, and I said, well, it's, you know, it's, it's not, it's not time. Your mom and I haven't worked that out yet. And he goes, well, you need to move out and you need to move out tonight. And if you don't, we're going to put your things on the curb. <laughs> and had I not done that work, um, I would have been very reactive. Now, if this is coming out of, not actually coming out of him, you know, in a way. It's coming out of the circumstances that he's in. But had I treated it just as a, this, you know, male f father, head of the household, and, you know, gone after him and, 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 and not been empathetically present with him, um, I might not have a relationship with him today. 
you know, a wonderful relationship with him today. You know, I moved to San Diego because. What did you do? Like, what, what, but what did you do that night? I I did kind of like I did with my grandson the other day. I just I just mirrored mirrored the difficulty of what of what was the uh, what was driving his request. And, uh, and, and apologize that I wasn't uh, going to be able to comply with it just yet, you know, that we hadn't worked it out. But it was in the, I think it was the powers was in the acknowledgement, you know, of his, of his experience at that time, not, not the compliance with his request. And uh, it's, uh, it's, it was a moment that, uh, and, and, you know, and the thing for me is I don't, I, I don't think I could have been prepared to do that. I happened to have been coming from my men's group that night. And I happened to have gotten a, a tremendous amount of support from those, those guys uh, throughout this whole time. Um, you know, and, uh, and I just had enough of the muscle memory at that point, you know, the emotional capacity to to do that and and you know that plus uh, other things like that uh, eventually I was able to uh, to ensure and renew restore my relationship with my kids which I, I think for me is better work than I've ever done in business <laughs> more important for me it's, it's, it's interesting when you said it's the power you said uh, let me rephrase it you said the power of acknowledgement and, and I, I totally agree because that's when I when I have like an argument, you know, uh, on, on a personal level and I actually express, you know, by the way, I felt I'm feeling hurt. Okay. And I'm just saying it out loud, not to blame the other person or to counter it, counter attack, but just like to acknowledge and express my, the way I feel. It seems that it's kind of like the genie is out of the bottle, but I feel immediate, immediate ease to a certain extent. Because it, 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 is, it is as if something has been lifted off me. Because exactly. in the past, I was conditioned not to express it. And only the last couple of years, I have learned to acknowledge, uh, to, uh, to identify and acknowledge my emotions and actually also talk about them more openly. Um, now, in business, it maybe, you know, it depends. But even in business, what I found out is that um, people are stunned. And maybe there is a, a, a moment of silence. Um, and then people realize, oh, by the way, he's human, I'm human. And so far, I have never experienced that they say, oh, come on, you know, you're such like, you know, a weak person. How can you say this? Never, ever. And that's, I, I think especially in times of crisis where people are more, um, which is sensible, they can s pick this up uh, more easily because they experience this by themselves. They have become more open. Um, and, and, and yet I still have to ask the question, like in, 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 a, in, in our so-called VUCA world where we are competing with AI and, and, and so much more machines, what have you, is there space for this humanity or is it too late? What do you, what do you think? <laughs> it's like also like Brian and, and Donna, what do you think? Is, this, is it maybe already too late for this um, sense of humanity? Have we lost this battle already? And should we just we, have to we, go along and compete with, with uh, AI and digitalization? Should we resolve, uh, uh, re resign ourselves to being automatons, you mean, already? Ah, yeah, that's the good question. Yeah, exactly. I mean, is, do, we have, do we still have the space to... Uh, well, the question is, is it a battle at all? Is it a competition? Or what is it? The battle is not with the um, automated and, and highly digitized world. Um, there's plenty where the digitized world just plain can't can't manage things. I was watching an, an old episode of Doctor Who last night where the, the doctor is facing off with uh, uh, a robot that had been set up as an a underground maintenance thing and, and had sort of taken things over. And he was lecturing the robot, you, you can't feel, you don't understand that humanity is, is all about life and you don't understand life. That's not the battle of that we need to face. The battle that we need to face is between the question of um, those who cling to this old, um, this outmoded sense of I cannot be vulnerable 
versus those of us who are willing to accept being vulnerable. You know, we're taught as little boys, you can't be vulnerable because you look weak and you can, you're not supposed to look weak. And that goes back to the original point that you were bringing up, you know, what boys don't cry, men do. <clears throat> those who've been able to mature are, rec are willing to recognize their potential vulnerability and even admit there are times that they can be wrong, as opposed to the, you know, we look at these, I won't even comment on the <clears throat> the great buffoon in the White House, but we'll, the, the, um... Oh, please do. <laughs> oh, right, they're not. Then we didn't ever start. No, no that's right. right. We, we don't have time for that. We never finish. Um, but all of these protests, it just dawns on me from this discussion that all these protests about, you know, stop the uh, the lockdowns. We, we want to open up the society. It's that these are people who don't want to admit that they could potentially be vulnerable and not only be vulnerable, but be carrying to other people that a disease, even if they themselves haven't yet uh, uh, shown symptoms. It's the, you know, we're invulnerable. We want to go right on with our life the way that it is right now. And this, I'm going, there's something you haven't accepted here. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. But, you know, I, but I, getting back to kind of the, the neuro is how can we face even face these problems without our human all of our human capacity being online right so so if we're going to get to um, you know collective intelligence we have to be open with each other right we have to potentially be wrong like you just mentioned um, and uh, and have a kind of uh, way of interacting that's just it's just much more creative and productive. And that that doesn't occur when we're contracted in in our fear and denial, right? It, it happens mm -hmm. when we're in our, our open uh, human, you know, creative prefrontal cortex and the and the lizard brain is quieted down. Um, we talk about psychological safety in mm -hmm. uh, in order for these um, these these team you know teams and businesses to be uh, to be to be effective. And and you know, Thomas, you mentioned sometimes you help create that by um, modeling, um, you know, uh, more of an openness or vulnerability, and that's I think that's a good uh, uh, one, good technique, you know, for that um, is to show safety that uh, you can um, you can bring um, these other parts forward, you know, within uh, within the uh, circumstances uh, for the benefit of everyone. Yeah, the, the, what, what I'm trying to do is like, if, if, if I experience, like I said, if I'm, one, if I'm a, f a facilitator, the same like coach or something, I try to create the, the, the space, safe space for, for people, they, they can show themselves, express themselves. And, uh, and then just, it's kind of like for a kid, you know, a, a, a kid wants to feel safe. It's like, it's, it's, it's a normal thing. And then when, when, once it does, it can open his or her heart. Um, you know that's what I've been experiencing. Otherwise, if it's if it's conditioned or if it's forced to um, hide um, his or her emotions, you know it can have huge impacts, and, and none of them are very positive. Um, and then you have you pay the the you know you see the aftermath afterwards. Uh, Brian, what what you said, I would like to come back to this, this one point. You said like um, boys don't cry, you know, conditioned and what have you. They they have this false sense of psychological safety. Uh, which is kind of like fake because they're actually hiding it from they're running away from it. On the other side, you have the men who do cry. And you said, because they have matured and recognize their imperfection. And I just, I mean, you said vulnerability. You know? I, I couldn't put it better. And I thought like, you know, because like he's like matured and they have recognized the imperfection, which I think like human, we humans are, perfect in our imperfection but we just have to realize that we that we are perfect in this imperfection because then we can laugh as much easier uh, we're not machines you know um but i just i just want to say you know because with maturing and um recognizing imperfection i just loved it cool <laughs> yeah christian mm -hmm. scriptures say our strength is made perfect in weakness <laughs> yes um 
I'm, I'm curious. Um, I mean, there are four guys here on, the, on this talk, uh, call, and, and, and Donna, and Donna. You, have been awfully, you have awfully been quiet. I mean, it's like, okay, you, you have four guys. You have four guys, okay? We're talking about emotions, and the only woman on the call just listening and not saying anything. You probably think, oh, gee, what have they been drinking or something? Or hardly. what is it? No, 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 hardly. I mean, this is what makes it real for me. Um, and and I, I can't, you know, the thing I put in the chat was just, there's this really, listening to you, there's this really bizarre contradiction over leadership. You know, to be a leader, you have to be vulnerable, but to be a man, you, you're not supposed to be. So, because that makes you weak. So how do you live that contradiction? I mean, there's a tension inherent in that, you know, between the conditioning and the role that people play and, and or that, you, you know, that men are basically expected to step up to. So to me, this is the real, these are the real conversations of the now. I mean, going back to what you were asking, Thomas, about, you know, is it too late? If we don't step into our humanity full on at this point, we've lost this moment. We've lost the opportunity that we have right now. And I'm, when I say we, it's, you know, it's not just men, it's all of us, but, but it, it is really, you know, for men to, uh, you know, because men play such an important role in society, it's really the place where rising above that contradiction, I think, is really the calling of today. So I'm yeah, loving you say what I'm hearing. It's an opportunity for, for what again? For humanity? For all, for, for all of us, all of humanity, you know, male, male, everybody to really appreciate life. I mean, that's, you know, your bike ride is, is an expression of that. You, you know, you've got all these things going on in the outer world, you get on your bike and all of a sudden the, the, the you know, the whole thing sort of, you know, the, the, the tensions melt away and there's this peace that's inherent. And I think it's coming, you know, recognizing the value of the relationships between ourselves and the natural world. That's, that's primo, but it's also the relationship with ourselves and to bypass that, like Brian, you're pointing out with these, these big protests we're seeing in the United States, at least, yeah. uh, is, is like a denial of that, you know, that, that invitation. Yeah. So I'm loving what I'm hearing. Thank you. Gives me hope. That, that journey, uh, Donna, you mentioned from, of leaders from power, positional power, you know, power over, that's uh, to mutuality, and uh, which, you know, is enabling and empowering others as well. And, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's, um, it's one of the hardest, it's one of the hardest pieces that we deal with in these organizations, you know, and it's, um, it's, it's one of the reasons I've been dreaming of a, of a, you know, corporate version. And there've been different versions of this over the years, but a kind of a corporate version of those men's weekends I've been going on to get these leaders on right, to experience the power and the beauty of, uh, of a different approach, you know, and because it's, it's, it's a mindset shift. I mean, it's, it's in many cases because, because it just works for so long the, the way that it's been working for folks having positional power and, you know, ex exercising that. And um, so I, I, I think it's still quite a challenge. I, I, have a, I have kind of like kind of a closing question for everyone. Maybe can, it would be great if uh, all of you could respond, uh, answer this one. And it's like, okay, all of us, we agree. It's a wonderful, it is, it's, it's maybe the last opportunity for us, uh, for humanity to, to, to mature, you can say, to, to rec uh, recognize our imperfection. Okay, it's great that we agree, but what does it take for more people to understand this, what can we do personally or in business, etc., to go to the next step? What is it that we can do, or we ought to do? Very well, often, the best thing that we can do is serve as, as examples and you know, exactly. explain ourselves as best we can. Some people, will, I mean, this is the old horse leading a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. You, you can show people what the responsible and mature adult can be can look like but people yeah. have to make the t choice to change and we, we could show them and i think you know this is where the case studies also help right so we give them examples of where people have made that journey and where it's really benefited you know themselves and the organizations we, i think we definitely got to be an example um and i um you know, I got frustrated with the political environment in, in the uh, U.S. You know, a while ago, and just I was obsessed with the news. This is 10 
years ago, 15 years ago, and I realized I didn't have any power or control over the political sphere other than my my vote. And I redoubled my efforts to um, to facilitate uh, the weekends. And uh, because I felt like one man at a time, you know, can go through this journey, they can uh, they can have an impact on their their kingdom, so to speak, the, their world that they influence. And uh, many, many of these, the, the group that I got most involved with is men coming out of um, the um, churches, mm. uh, ultimately, and uh, that, uh, that have been so co-opted, you know, and, and I realized there wasn't going to be any other way to, to help this political process until um, I just worked one man at a time in those environments and helped eventually get enough um, volume uh, community, you know, that has this new perspective together that they can be a tipping point in those organizations. So it's, it's one thing. Mm -hmm. Well, actually, Brian, you actually also, I just read your, your, your chat, what you said, like, uh, Angela Merkel's TV appearance address was so special because she said, like, you know, honestly, I don't know. I don't know exactly if this is the right thing because we have never experienced this. We do the best as we can. Um, and from, from our point of view, this is what the best view is. And this we'll see, we'll revisit it in two weeks and we'll see it go from there. And acknowledging that a politician doesn't or can't know all the answers makes, it, uh, makes that person more human. Okay, there comes a point where you have to provide answers and you have to reflect and um, you know, admit, okay, this didn't work out, you know, let's, let's do something different. Uh, that's a different thing, that's also an art. Um, but uh, that's a good good example, I think. Um, yeah, Donna, does have anything to add? Yeah, it's a good example because it speaks truth to the moment. I mean, that is the truth. There's no dancing around it. So to pretend that that's not the case would be, you know, completely wrong. So it's that's that's where vulnerability and, and power have a you know demonstrate themselves. So I love that example. Christian. I mean, just what can we do? I think we can just continue to grow ourselves um, and communicate into the world that we are and share the challenges that we're feeling while growing, while evolving, while becoming more and more and more vulnerable and, and share these stories with the world. And um, that, that to me is a paradigm shift in itself because I've always been acknowledged as somebody who gives answers and I'm really starting to evolve to somebody who just poses questions. To the world and the world sees my transformation and it's an invitation that I'm trying to issue to everybody around me wherever I go and to make ourselves aware of that we're actually you know personified invitations to authenticity and wholeness and love if we can make ourselves aware that we are and really walk the world with that self-view I think we've done the utmost and everybody's actions and journey in this context is a little bit different. One of the members of our congregation participates in, a, in an <clears throat> ongoing thing called the Jericho Project in which he and a couple of, I think, several other people meet with men who are in one of the local prisons here mm. uh, down the way in Walt, Massachusetts. And as a regular conversation thing to, to help these guys who are in prison become more self-aware to understand their circumstances and, and do something to change their own lives. I have my, I, I put, I, I have the greatest respect for Larry for, for doing that kind of thing. I don't think that would be my strength to do that sort of thing, but there are different things that different people can do. And even if just serving as an example, as Christian says, it, that's, that has a lot of power. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, I went into that jail once a week for a while. It was, it was very life affirming. And it was always interesting, the new volunteers that would come with me, I always felt initially like they were there to impart something, you know, to the uh, detainees as they're technically are in jail. And, and instead, you know, they saw the journey that these men were on and they quickly realized that there was work they needed to do in their own life and they were being blessed by the example that these people were providing them. <laughs> 
Well, you know, it's like what, what you said, like it's, a, it's definitely revealing. It's, 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 it's an awakening experience. Um, and it's like, also I just like used my, my um, highlighter today. It's like, what, were, what are some of, the some of the takeaways, you know, and we talk about power of acknowledgement. We talked about uh, recognizing our imperfection, which is a maturing process. It's appreciating life uh, that versus machines. And you talked about uh, Doctor Who, I, I really like that. Um, see, even back then, they knew that what they were talking. And I, I think they should just, they should, uh, more people should watch it, you know, learn from it. Um, so this has, de you know, I definitely have a better understanding of why bo uh, boys don't cry, men do. And uh, probably there is actually a chapter in my new book um, about, you know, with this, just say boys, boys don't cry or guys don't cry or something. But I think I meant have to ch uh, change it to boys don't cry, men do, because I think it is more, uh, reflective it's more on the point and it's kind of like it's not really an irony but it's like it's showing that both sides and even in this per imperfection is a human so um, thank you so much for for this uh, for your insights and uh, for for this dialogue and I I hope you all um, took something uh, with you on and uh, so again thank you so much thank you Thomas <laughs> thank you Tom thank you so much once again an inspiring hour Thank you um, very much. Thank you for everybody. The one, one, one last, one, one more thing, one last uh, regarding next week. Uh, I, there could be a change. Um, I still have to decide by Friday uh, whether or not I will continue this format or if there will be something different. Could, good chance that next week will be uh, this dialogue once more, but the week after, I'm actually uh, thinking of launching um, a, a prototype um, where I would invite people to not just talk, but actually to build something like either projects or some form of practice. And we'll see, this is like, just came up over the last couple of days and uh, some friend of mine, he kicked me in my butt yesterday. So like, why don't just quit talking, you know, walk, uh, uh, walk your own talk. <laughs> and so I guess I have to deliver. So uh, we'll see. I will keep you in the loop um, if and how things are changing, but um, I really appreciate your time and, and, and the insights. So thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much for this. Yeah. Thank you. Look forward to it.